Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, Avi Lewis, the director of a brand new film, This Changes Everything. Grassroots movements are changing everything, says Lewis. All that and a few words for me on the women at the front of those movements. Welcome to our program. I am here with Avi Lewis, dear friend, incredible filmmaker. Hi, Laura. Congratulations on this next most amazing film. This changes everything. Thank you so much. It has been a rather long labor, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> and quickly, just remind us, it was inspired by Naomi's book, Naomi Klein's book. Your it wife. was a parallel process. Um, we actually decided that to, to try to get radical ideas and new framings, new narratives into a very cluttered culture, and as we look at all the different screens in our lives, we thought we should try to come out of as many as possible. So started the book and the film and a web outreach political pillar of the project all at the same time. And they developed uh, in parallel over five years, which is why we can't really say it's based on the book. It's my exploration of Naomi's ideas in the world. But it's confusing because it's narrated by her and they're her ideas. So it, it, is a, it is a Klein Lewis joint. Production. All right, very good. Well, let's play, let's play the trailer. Take a look. The majority of the human race does not see global warming as a serious threat. Celebrate! <laughs> Climate legislation is dead. We in the global north, with less than 20% of the population, are responsible for over 70% of global emissions. We are drilling all over the place. On the other side of the world, those people who are the most affected by climate change, most affected by environmental injustice, have the least responsibility for creating this crisis in the first place. The amount of fossil fuel that we're combusting year on year is growing. We're going in completely the wrong direction. I've spent six years wandering through the wreckage caused by the carbon in the air and the economic system that put it there. That old paradigm will be forced to change, either by the environment around us or by us. We are all part of this movement! When you see communities who are thrown into the front line, and you see the incredible transformation. They become stronger, they stand up. So here's the big question. What if global warming isn't only a crisis? What if it's the best chance we're ever going to get to build a better world? Change or be changed. There are limits. Let's celebrate the limits because we can reinvent a different future. So the trailer ends there with this sense of opportunity. Mm -hmm. This isn't the crisis of the climate isn't just a crisis, but our chance to remake the world anew. Um, is it? Well, I, 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 good, fair question, right? I, I think that the, so first of all, the this in This Changes Everything isn't the book or the film or our idea. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a bombastic title, but it's not, you know, we're not that soaked in hubris. Climate change changes everything. We are in for dramatic physical change to our world one way or another. On the track that we're on, we already have 0.8 degrees Celsius of warming from what's locked in from the Industrial Revolution up until now. We're headed for four degrees or more. Even two degrees, if the world's governments finally came together and had a meaningful binding deal, would still mean massive physical changes. The future is radical, one way or another. We have an opportunity to get off this path and actually move to a low-carbon, post-carbon society in a way that serves the needs of justice, where people who got the worst deal in the old economy are first for the, for the benefits of the next economy. And, and we have a way to address the, the, the fundamental problem of an economic system that creates inequality and suffering as the endless byproduct of wealth for the few. And that's and really what I 
appreciated about your film and what made it so different from others like An Inconvenient Truth? Well, you say at the beginning of the trailer, you didn't want to make another polar bear flick. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's, it's finding, and this was the, the kernel of Naomi's idea when she started, before she had all of the argument and evidence marshaled and before I'd gone out and shot all the stories, she kind of helped put together, put the dots together to say, the logic of the economic system itself is what's driving this crisis. And that's an opportunity, because we know that system and that logic needs changing. Like you say, just say to anyone, can we have infinite growth on a finite planet? It's like, no, duh, obviously not. And yet our entire world yeah. is fashioned on that premise. It's so, fashioned on a story. And yes. one of the other clips that we have has to do with exactly that. The problem is the story. Take a look at this. Can I be honest with you? I've always kind of hated films about climate change. What is it about those vanishing glaciers and desperate polar bears that makes me want to click away? Is it really possible to be bored by the end of the world? It's not that I don't care what happens to polar bears. It's just that we're told that the cause isn't out there. It's in us. It's human nature. We're innately greedy and short-sighted. And if that's true, there is no hope. But when I finally stopped looking away, traveled into the heart of the crisis, met people on the front lines, I discovered so much of what I thought I knew was wrong. And I began to wonder, what if human nature isn't the problem? What if even greenhouse gases aren't the problem? What if the real problem is a story, one we've been telling ourselves for 400 years? Take us back to that moment of the, the story being told. Because several things came together right at that same time. The engineers yeah. discovering that they could harness the Earth's resources mm -hmm. in a whole different way. And eco economics changing too. Well, you have this period of the, of the Enlightenment, the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, uh, and the birth of, of modern capitalism, all fueled, I mean, lots of you know, parallel and of unfolding historical processes, but fossil fuels takes the existing colonialism, slavery, um, emergence of international trade, and turbocharges yeah. it, and things go into hyperdrive for capitalism in this period of unfettered growth. But what it did to us as a species is, and this is in the West, Right, and this is not, we're not talking about all humans here by, by any means, but it gave people in, in, in the global north this idea that we really could decouple from nature. It didn't, we could sail whether there was wind or not. We could, you know, b b before fossil fuels, factories had to be near rushing water right. to power the machines. All of a sudden, you could put factories where there were pools of cheap labor in cities. And so the explosion of capitalism, of colonialism, all you know got fueled by the by the by the technology of digging up fossil fuels and burning them and that drove a story and that story still runs our world we still act globally like we can uh, harvest anything from nature that we can extract anything from nature that we can bend nature to our will and that there will never be any mm. consequences and the earth is screaming at us that there are consequences that this is not true and we need a new story to understand our place in the world our relationship with nature now if i have my history right i think the steam engine was it invented the very same year as the american revolution well there's there's a lots of interesting historical moments that Which makes this a really american it. story it's a very american story um but it is you know it it, it is like the there the version of the steam engine um that really drove the industrial revolution also was commercialized in the same year as Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. So it's a capitalist story. This, you know, fossil-fueled capitalism is still the system that we live in. You have a lot of people in the film who talk about exactly that, but at least the first one that mentions the name of the system, capitalism, says it with great trepidation. Yes, yeah. Well, we, we had a lot of conversations in the, in, in the process, in our editorial process about the C word. You know? <laughs> Naomi's book is called This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. And I didn't use capitalism versus the climate in the film title 
because I, you know, because I, I didn't want to create the expectation that this was going to be a film where people discuss capitalism. Then you're defining it, you're having a debate, all of a sudden you're making a talking heads film. I wanted to make a film that was rooted in personal stories, in lived experience, in communities in struggle, people who are changing the world in the face of great threat. So, but it, the capitalism needs to be there. It's the yeah. subtext of the entire thing. So the first time, and this was very intentional, is about 45 minutes into the movie, Naomi's interviewing a woman who's one of the leaders uh, of a community struggle against a Canadian gold mine in northern Greece. And she says, we have to get to the core of the problem before we can solve it. And Naomi says, well, what's the core of the problem? <laughs> no, having no idea what she's going to say. And she says, well, I, it's the economic system of capitalism, I guess. And she's so sheepish yeah. about saying the word. And it's just, it's just a stark reminder of how hard it is to yeah. name the system that we live in, yeah. to actually have honest conversations about the underpinning of our entire uh, global economy. So I, I left that moment in because it just seems to reveal so much about how hard it is to deal, to change the grand narratives. And yet it's at the center of, of everything. So we're going to come back to Greece in a second, but while we're talking about capitalism, let's talk about China. Mm -hmm. um, you report from China on one of the most stark crises that's also providing opportunities for change. You want to set up the next clip? Well, I mean, I, I guess for the last 10 years, until I really started studying what's going on with climate change um, and pollution in China for this project, I kind of bought, like a lot of us do, that, you know, well, aren't, isn't China building a new coal-fired power plant every week, and they're already the largest emitter, and they're consuming half the world's coal, and isn't it China that's going to, like, it's, it's all about China now. Uh-uh. Actually, when I looked into it, it turned out that China's got a lot of serious climate policies right. and that things are actually changing there. And, well, you know, when I went there, I found something that I didn't expect. Previously, the environment issues are just peanuts. We can deal with it when we become rich enough. And then we had this historical moment of uh, smog disaster. It totally changed the landscape of environment discussion in China. Ulan you know, when you wake up in the morning and you walk, you cannot walk out in the street, you cannot walk out because you can't breathe. People are saying, no, this cannot be, this cannot be the way uh, society in the world is supposed to be about. Air pollution has really become a very uh, big topic in China and the rising middle class people in China, you know, after their living standards in many ways have improved um, a lot, now start to ask, when can we buy clean air? Taking us to the next part of your film, some thoughts on China. Are the changes that we're seeing here from the bottom up or from the top down? I, I mean, in China, it's obviously both. Yeah. So there is no democracy there. But in a weird way, the Chinese government fearing revolution. I mean, the, the Communist Party of China fears another revolution. They've had them before there. If you can't take and your children outside. So they're seeing that the environment is the number one issue in China. And people are literally choking on growth. This galloping growth has produced uh, an atmosphere that people cannot breathe in. And so there's this upwelling in Chinese society. There's a lot of protest around envi environmental damage from, from industrial projects. And they're trying to keep a lid on it, but they're also letting you know, these protests take place at the government level. So people, you know, weirdly, I think the Chinese government, in, when it comes to in environmental damage, may be more responsive yeah. than democratic governments because they really fear that it could boil over and challenge their power if they don't clean things up. And so they're moving fast. The last coal plant in Beijing is being retired this year. Uh, last year was the first year of this century when coal use d declined in China, and the explosion of renewables in China has lowered the price of solar technology for the world by 75% in six years. 
So there's a lot going on in China that gives us hope. It's not in any way a model, yeah. but it's an important battleground that we have, to, we have to know what we're talking about before we let ourselves off the hook because China's the problem. Another important battleground is Greece. You mentioned it before, but going <coughs> back to that struggle, you happen to be reporting on the climate tuss fights I in Greece while the anti-austerity fight mm -hmm. was happening. Uh, where do things stand now? And then I want to ask you about this question of yes, because there's a fabulous guy in your Greek segment who says, we have to say no before we can say yes. Yeah. And I want to know what people are saying yes to. Well, this is, this is critical. I mean, so this battle in, that we document in the film is over a Canadian uh, gold mining company in this beautiful, sensitive ecosystem in northern Greece. And it's a community struggle to stop this gold mine. But the extraction in Greece, whether it's gold or the fact that they're trying to open up oil drilling in the Aegean and Ionian Sea, like what could go wrong, right, in one of the most beautiful storied oceans on Earth, is all being brought in because of the crisis, yeah. which we know is largely invented and profited on and imposed by European and other financial powers. The financial crisis. The, 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 it's, a, it's another expression of the financial crisis of 2008 as it's pushed around the world by, by, the great, by, by the great financial powers. So people in Greece are being punished with the most brutal austerity ever seen in Europe. And they're cracking open all of these resources. They're selling all the ports and privatizing everything. And they're also forcing extractive projects. So people who are resisting this gold mine are actually resisting austerity and everything that's being shoved down their throats in its name. And they actually understand that there are sustainable ways to continue their economy that don't require massive cuts to social programs, that don't require gouging the earth and gouging the people. And so they want local control of their natural resources mm -hmm. because the people that live with the resource need to rely on it for generations. And people who come in from another country to dig it up, sell it, and leave, leave a desert behind, as they say, um, have no stake in that place. And so these place-based struggles, I think, you know, that's what Teo says in the film. This is the no before the yes. And the yes is something much bigger. Local control of resources so that people can steward the land um, and not just extract from it. Which gets to the question of whether growth per se is the problem. Is it growth per se? I, there's a great degrowth movement in Europe. Uh, Naomi and I, uh, you know, have our qualms with it because actually if you think about moving to a, to a truly post-carbon economy, there are huge sectors of the economy that need to grow. And as a matter of fact, they're the exact sectors of the economy that have been most brutalized under neoliberalism. So when I talk about green jobs, and in Canada we have a project called the LEAP Manifesto, we're starting to articulate the policies that could get us to a better, to a better country and also off fossil fuels at the same time. We talk about green jobs not just as guys in hard hats putting up wind turbines. All of the caring professions are the existing low carbon economy. Yeah. Teaching, healthcare, caregiving, daycare, the arts. Um, this is all low carbon activity. Mm -hmm. And those are the very sectors that have been so savaged in the last 30 to 40 years of, uh, of neoliberalism globally. Those are the sectors we need to build back. Your film ends on a really positive note about blockadia, grassroots movements all over the world and the country connecting and resisting. I want to believe, I do want to believe, you know I'm an optimist right up there with you. But I look at the news of the last few weeks and months and I look at the way that the Greek anti-austerity party was um, really muscled into submission by the lenders. Yeah. I look at how Obama's EPA emissions uh, rules on coal plants was put into suspension uh, for years for electoral reasons. The only reason Shell seems to be leaving Alaska is because of the practicalities of drilling and the cost of it in the current economy. If we believe Shell. Well, well talk to me. I mean, yeah. Well, okay, as we're, as, we're, as, we're, as, we're, as, we're, as we're playing the, you know, hope poker, <laughs> let, I'll, 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 I'll see your Obama's the EPA regs and, and, uh, and other things. Look at the explosion of, of response to the Pope. Mm -hmm. What's he talking about? Climate change and inequality in America. Look at the tens of thousands of people at Bernie Sanders rallies. What's he talking about? Climate change and inequality. Look at Hillary Clinton saying that she said that she is opposed yeah. to the Keystone XL pipeline. She she and when she was in the State Department, she couldn't wait to rubber stamp that thing. Obama held it back. Now she's looking at polling and it's overwhelming that half the country that votes Democrat, those people don't believe in tar sands pipelines going through the United States. So I think we do see tremendous victories mm -hmm. on the movement side. We're not winning. We're losing. Emissions are going up. We are hurtling in the wrong direction as a global society. But there's an amazing momentum in the climate mm -hmm. justice movement. To be here in New York 
where one year ago there were half a million people on the streets in the People's Climate uh, March, and to see the explosion of the divestment movement. Now there's $1.2 trillion of capital that is pledging to divest its, uh, take away, you know, sell its investments in fossil fuels. Like there are victories we need to remember to celebrate them without, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid because right. there's a lot of work to do. Bobby, thank you so much. The director of This Changes Everything will go out with a final clip on Blockadia, the global movement. People aren't just writing to their politicians, politely asking them to do the right thing. They're taking direct action, demanding it. On the front lines, they call it Blockadia. The idea behind it is simple. We're in a hole, and before anything new can grow, we have to stop digging. As the drilling rigs and pipelines crisscross the earth, so does Blockadia, connecting communities along the way. The metal pathways of dirty energy confronted by this new web of resistance. So, first night being here in this pipe. And I've noticed something else. At the forefront, are the people from the sacrifice zones, the very ones who have been written off for hundreds of years, the keepers of that other story. If this pipeline goes through, your government will further assist in the raping and pillaging of the lands of my ancestors. Then they'll promise to give us back what was never theirs in the first place. of what reclamation is. Reclamation is me standing here with the 99%. We're here today to say we never went anywhere and nor do we plan to. When you see communities who are thrown into the front line because an environmental or political or economic issue is imposed on them, you see the incredible transformation that happens. They become stronger, they stand up. And you're like, isn't this incredible? Isn't this the society we want? Towards the end of the new film, This Changes Everything, Naomi Klein, author of the book that inspired the movie, notices something about the people who are leading the charge for change. They come from sacrifice zones, she points out, the very same places the powers that be have written off for environmental or ecological devastation. There's another thing about them, too. From Beijing to Montana to the Alberta tar sands, those people in the front lines of resistance are female. In one stirring scene, Indian grandmothers plant themselves in front of the filmmaker's car, refusing to let it pass until they're absolutely sure it's bound for the village, not the nearby coal mine. In another, a Chinese filmmaker asks her daughter if she's ever seen Blue Sky, and the film of their encounter attracts a million viewers in a week. There's Naomi too, of course. In her book, she touches on her struggle to get pregnant and her suspicions about pollution. My point, though, isn't that female biology explains female behavior. I don't believe that. But women's experiences are relevant. And I think women are in the forefront of the struggle against sacrifice zones because Women know a thing or two about being sacrificed. Take right now, every armed force from ISIS to the United Nations seems to agree that women's bodies can be sacrificed to war, for war. So too women's work. A new study from the Kinsey Group reports that women are still doing 75% of the unpaid work around the world. In the U.S. alone, that adds up to $1.5 trillion in value sacrificed. And all too often, our lives and life chances are just too inconvenient to mention. When Pope Francis, on his visit to the U.S., met for a moment with an opponent of marriage equality, it caused a firestorm. The fact that for his entire trip, the Pope was surrounded by men and an institution that opposed female equality was met with a respectful hush. 
women. As the artist Barbara Kruger so famously said, your body is a battleground. So it's no surprise women know a thing or two about sacrifice zones and about fighting back. To tell me what you think, write to me, Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.com. And thanks. What would our world look like today if our media showed us as much collaboration as they do competition? What if we got to meet people making change right here, right now, in all sorts of ways we're usually told are impossible? Subscribe today to The Laura Flanders Show for in-depth interviews with forward-thinking people. Smarts, not sound bites, every week, right here. Subscribe and thanks. Today on The Laura Flanders Show, Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. So there was slavery all across the world, but in most countries, slavery was a transitional status. It could happen to anyone. It was not permanent. They were societies with slaves. America became something different. We became a slave society. Later in the show, we find out how your community can be part of his history marking project. Join us in this conversation so that we can move forward together. This week on the show, author, activist, Naomi Klein. Good news is this economic system is failing us on so many other fronts. We have so many other reasons to challenge it. And I think it's really critical to understand the connection between highly unequal societies and fossil fuels. And we go back into our archives and out into the streets to bring you a cacophony of people taking action. All that and my weekly commentary. This week, are we really going to let Wall Street bet on our planet the way they gambled on our homes? It's all coming up.